57 years apart, Ernestine and Tom, we bring them to you for a wonderful evening. Please join me in welcoming them as I hand them off to Harry. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be with Tom and Ernestine. I, I've got to say, and it's an unmitigated plug, this is a great read, So, um, and uh, it's wonderful to see that these two people, one thing you get from the book is that they are incredible and incredibly invested in the sense of civic work, and that's what we'll talk about with them, the sense of their passion of commitment to doing something in the interest of the public good, and even as there's this divide in terms of age and divide in terms of experience, you'll see there's a unity in terms of vision around these ideas and why it's important now more than ever to think about notions of civic work. So let's start at the beginning, you two, and, and talk about how did this happen? How did this book come to be and what was the genesis of it? Well, I can start that. Uh, I have worked um, over the course of uh, my years uh, in the federal government for now five different presidents in the State Department and foreign aid and legal services. Um, and I wanted to write a book uh, about why I thought and how uh, people of all ages, but particularly young people, could be involved in public service. And uh, when I talked to a publisher, uh, she said, um, well, you're 79 years old, actually. I was 76 back then, but still. Uh, and if you really want to appeal to young people, you need a youth voice. And uh, that sounds so obvious that how could I not think of that, but in fact I hadn't. And so I... Um, asked a, a bit around and um, came to um, the smartest connector I know, Kim Meredith, and said, uh, Kim, what am I going to do? And she said, I know just what you're going to do. You're going to go and talk with Ernestine Fu, who's a Stanford undergraduate, because uh, she would be the perfect match as a co-author for you. And I said, okay. And um, I got Ernestine's uh, resume, which um, uh, was not quite as thick as this book, but it was close. <laughs> and I turned back to uh, Kim and said, this is ridiculous. She can't possibly do this. She's been doing so many things so often she can't sleep, and you're asking the, her to consider doing one more thing? And Kim said, trust me. And I do, and I did, and Ernestine and I uh, sat down, talked, and um, uh, we started working together, and that was three plus years ago, and it's uh, been a wonderful partnership ever since. Ernestine, you want to add? Yeah, so coming to Stanford, I knew I wanted to study in the engineering school, and I had no interest in doing research in the humanities school, but I did know that I wanted to continue my public service involvement, which began in middle school and high school. So started working, as Kim mentioned, with the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, became involved in student government, and one day Kim said, you should meet this person named Tom Erlich, who he's done a lot of incredible work, and you should talk to him about his new project. And um, at the time, I was actually taking 20 units, and I had no interest in doing research, not in the engineering school. So it was a little bit difficult finding a time to meet with Tom. And then um, I'm really glad I did, because we met and hit off really well, and was really excited by the work he was doing and what he had done. And three years later, this is the result of it. So talk a little bit more about that process and what it was like. With, and are there any particular lessons you think you learned, and we'll start with you, Ernestine, working with somebody 57 years as has been pointed out in age difference? Mm -hmm. So before I met Tom, I had no idea what it meant to devote an entire career to public service as Tom has done. And I think that's one of the biggest things I learned. I think a lot of young people these days are disillusioned with government and politics. And Tom, when he wasn't in higher education, he spent his entire career in government. And 
I think it's been extremely inspirational to have an, a mentor and a collaborator who has been involved in that way. Tom? Well, I learned an enormous amount from Ernestine. The first thing uh, we did together, was, and uh, I use the royal we because it was really Ernestine, who brought together 60 or 70 young people, some from Stanford, from some, from, some who are in this room, uh, but some from uh, literally all over the country, who were doing uh, terrific civic work. And by civic work, we mean both avocational work uh, and vocational work. We mean both working for nonprofits and working in the government. Uh, most of them were working for nonprofit organizations, helping people in need in terms of food, shelter, education, uh, and so forth. And uh, we talked to them in focus groups, and I was blown away by this group mm. of young people. And if I could take the world and just say, here, run it, I'd do it in a minute, because <laughs> they were so inspiring. And Ernestine was able uh, to fashion uh, some of their stories in the sections of the book that uh, she wrote. We have seven lessons in this book, and each of us wrote uh, a section. Uh, we each helped each other write, but uh, each of us has a section of each of these seven lessons. And hers draw particularly on, uh, on those remarkable young people. But it started, since uh, she won't boast, I will, with her uh, decision when she was just 15 to start an ensemble uh, to play for centers of seniors and disabled people around the Los Angeles area where she was living. And uh, before she graduated from high school, there were a uh, half a dozen ensembles uh, that uh, were doing the same thing, and she just was on a trajectory that kept on going ever since. Now, Tom, you talked a little bit about the organization of the book, that there is a section of each of the seven lessons is a section that the two have together, then there's a Tom section and uh, an Ernestine section. What about collaboration and the idea of collaboration? Was it a process you've done before? You've written books with other people before. So how about this process of collaboration? What's the key to making a collaboration work? And Ernestine, I'll ask you the same question later but in a second. But what's the key? Well, we developed a profound uh, trust and appreciation for each other. Ernestine's perspectives are very different than mine. No surprise, 57 years. Primarily in the nonprofit sector, mine primarily in government, but we both believe with a passion in uh, what we call civic work. Uh, can call it public service, as we do uh, also in the title. And uh, we had a realization, both of us, that our democracy to function effectively needs both nonprofit organizations for a strong civil society and effective government agencies. At the very time we're facing this incredible gridlock, mm -hmm. it's important to underscore that really good people like those in this room, are needed in government to make it work effectively. And so we both felt both ways. We helped each other. Uh, Ernestine edited uh, my stuff. I edited hers. And uh, we had a good time doing it. That's great. I think it was definitely a very collaborative process. Um, so Tom has written over a dozen books already before this one. And this is my first one. And I could not have wished for a better first co-author. and. I think one thing that, just to demonstrate the collaborative process, there's a building here called Old Union at Stanford where all the different student government groups regularly hold meetings and usually you don't see anyone over the age of 30 there except um, maybe a few administrators, but... I've only um, been there once. You've been there <laughs> once, okay. So Vice Provost of Undergrad Education has been there once. Um, so Tom has been there a couple of times because we decided to hold focus group interviews with a group of young students there. and. Um, 
we were just in a room and there were sofas and Tom was sitting there and there were clear glass walls and when other students were walking by, they always did a double take because they were wondering why someone um, Tom's age, a professor, was there and I think he was very collaborative in that process, just to show one example. I mentioned working for all the presidents that you worked for. Your backgrounds, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, the service, but what drove you to do this? Why? What's the passion? There are a number of factors, but I am absolutely convinced that mentors and teachers are key. One of our seven lessons is just that, that if you are fortunate you will have some mentors, as both Ernestine and I have, and some teachers. Um, I can still feel the presence of uh, John W. Gardner here, uh, who cared so deeply about uh, the kind of public service that uh, we talk about, who is a mentor uh, uh, f for me. Um, and. Um, over the course of the years, uh, I've had a lot of wonderful ones, uh, none better than my wife of 56 years, who's sitting right here, Ellen, uh, who has uh, taught me a lot about uh, public service, about civic work uh, in different ways, and uh, as we have uh, grown on together. So I would put that at the very top of the list of the, the foreword, and uh, this is a, a written by Bill Drayton, president of the Deshoka Innovators for the Public, and he asserts that, quote, everyone in this generation of children and young people must master the complex underlying skills required for change making and know they are change makers before they turn 21. So there's an emphasis on youth and college age and then this sense of the, this is the audience potentially that you want for the book. So um, talk a little bit about that quote and uh, why you want to reach this audience with this book. I think um, Bill Drayton's is exactly right in terms of you want young people to start creating change, start giving back to their communities at a very early age. I think when you start doing so at an early age, it becomes almost like a habit, a part of your identity. And um, it could be very simple, such as just volunteering somewhere once a week and then I think um, it's hard to change the behavior of someone who's older on and not engaged in public service early on, although it is possible. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh, absolutely. It's uh, never too early to start. I will say, contra uh, my dear friend Bill Drayton, it is never too late either. <laughs> but it's always good to start early. And uh, uh, Ernestine hit it exactly right. If it becomes part of your identity, of who you are, of how you express yourself, uh, of how you think of yourself, how you get satisfaction uh, in your daily life is by being involved in working with others. Not that it's, quote, serving others or giving back, but rather you have a relationship with others where you grow and develop uh, as part of yourself and uh, and, and learn to appreciate uh, the differences, uh, the good fortunes that you may have had, uh, the challenges that you've had and so forth. Uh, all that's tied up to doing it and, and if possible, uh, starting early. I did run an organization called the Legal Services Corporation, which f funds civil legal help for poor people. Uh, and when I started in 19, 75, we had um, uh, soon uh, 6,000 lawyers, 6,000 paralegals. Now that sounds like a lot, but we had to serve 34 million poor people. Mm. So the only way to do that was to attract practicing lawyers. And I gave a lot of talks to a lot of lawyers in every state of the union. And time and again, I would hear from very high-priced lawyers who are doing derivatives and other things, and I'd say, give us some of your time, some of your talent uh, to help people in need in housing, uh, food stamps, some other, and they'd say, well, you know, I really don't know anything about that. Uh, and I said, well, actually, we have a program in a couple of weeks, you can learn very well, 
And then they say, well, I don't think they would feel comfortable uh, in the same room with me. Well, I'm a little slow, but it didn't take too long before I was understood. What they were really saying was, I won't feel comfortable going in a room with a lot of poor people, particularly if their skin colors are different than mine. And I, that was an epiphany for me because it made me understand that we really have an obligation in schools and colleges to help our students engage in doing service the way the Haas Center does, the way Greg Werkheiser is here. He started a wonderful new center that Ernestine's on the board of to bring civic engagement uh, around the, the country. Uh, and uh, um, Elena Cada and Campus Compact, those organizations are all involved in helping young people learn uh, uh, before they become those tired old men that I just described. I want to pick up a little bit on that. You mentioned Campus Compact and the Haas Center, these organizations. Where do you think we are in higher ed right now in terms of this mission that you suggested that uh, getting young people to think about civic engagement? When uh, my colleagues and I wrote a book called Educating Citizens, what we found was there was an explosion of interest in doing civic work that involved tutoring a kid, cleaning up a park, working in a community kitchen, but when it involved policy making or politics, they said, hands off. And actually, what we really learned was there were very few opportunities for students to do that. Ernestine, uh, looking at that, can you talk specifically about Stanford and your experience at Stanford and what has enabled you? I mean, one of the things that you talk about in, in the book is a variety of activists that you interacted with, like Michael Tubbs. Um, so, so what was the environment at Stanford that enabled you and, and, uh, and what kind of environment or support did you find for your own efforts at Civil mm -hmm. War? Um, so on the academic side of things, I myself took a number of community service learning courses. I took one in which I was um, developing course syllabus and a course syllabus and also tutoring students in East Palo Alto. Um, another one I took was um, focused on helping um, people who couldn't walk um, and visiting senior centers um, based on that. So there are definitely a number of great community service learning courses. And I think what's also really key is that um, the professors I spoke with, it wasn't just about doing a major and then pursuing a career that directly relates to your major. You see a lot of students do interdisciplinary work mm -hmm. and um, that I think is very important just because if you look at, for example, just outside of Stanford, um, take for example college rankings and um, Tom and I wrote a piece, re an online article for Forbes magazine looking at college rankings and how they don't directly reflect what a student's um, experiences are during college and after college. So they might focus, for example, on test scores, but not necessarily um, if you go into a public service career, which might have a lower pay than that of um, kind of a more prestigious career, and it doesn't take into account that. So I think there's a lot of external factors that may influence a student um, not to go into public service. but. At Stanford itself, I think the community service learning courses, um, just teachers and great centers like the PAC Center, the Hodge Center, California Campus Compact, encouraging students to actually engage in public service and not just look at something that directly impacts their academic career. Um, we want to make more effort in these arenas and uh, we're doing several things. We've started a new program that will hopefully produce more um, service learning courses as well as opportunities for students to engage more. And so wondering about that, Ernestine, did you find that there was, was it, did you feel alone or was there a community of, of folks involved here? I think there definitely is a community. And um, I think perhaps particularly at Stanford um, compared to other universities, there's this pull on social entrepreneurship just because we have Silicon Valley right in our backyard. So you have students who are not only looking to start for-profit companies, which is often the stories you hear, but also um, terrific nonprofits and hybrid companies. So um, one person we mentioned in the book and a good friend, um, Garrick Neiman, who started College Spring, and he decided that he, right after college, he got a full-time offer from McKinsey, one of the top consulting firms, but he turned that down in order to start a nonprofit focused on 
um, reducing the gap for underprivileged low-income students and providing them with college prep in order to get into the top universities. So he's just one example of a social entrepreneur and I think there's a community at Stanford where a lot of people are interested particularly in social entrepreneurship. Yeah, it, 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 just one more thing on, on social entrepreneurship and then I, I want to look at some other areas in the book, but it's in the, the last section where you sort of lay out some action steps, you talk about social entrepreneurship as a way. Why is that, why do you think that's effective now, mm -hmm. potentially now in this area? Mm -hmm. um, I think things have changed since Tom's generation. So during Tom's time growing up in the World War II era, a lot of people were more devoted to government work, public policy, simply because um, there was a war going on and there was a sense of contributing to the nation as a whole through that. But then I think nowadays a lot of young people are less interested in that kind of work, but more involved in um, seeing a direct impact on their work, taking, it, their initi taking initiative to start something um, working in their local communities, being able to, for example, visit a senior center and directly see the impact of their work or build a home um, somewhere and actually see someone inhabit that. So I think um, things have changed over time and it's not, I think people don't, students my age, young people don't necessarily see government work as the only solution to solving a need. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Tom's time. <laughs> and one of the things the book functions at as is, uh, in effect, a memoir, um, and we get a real sense both and their stories are, are fascinating, very different, but uh, fascinating in terms of that. So, Tom, if you could reflect in, in a sense on what, I don't know, what it was for you to, to write that, to, to dig deep into your past, to, to shape these memories into it, and uh, um, the notion of the personal as political and how you feel about that in your own experience. Well, I do think uh, that in a certain sense the personal is political because as a person I feel a political obligation to do my best to help others as part of who I am. It may not be political in, in partisan sense, most of the times it isn't, but it is political in the sense that it is a commitment to engaging in activities uh, that can help others. And I am uh, firmly of the belief that while a lot of those can be done uh, by the wonderful nonprofit organizations of the kind that Ernestine has uh, herself created and that others uh, that we write about are created, uh, government has an enormously important set of roles on the local, on the state, on the national uh, level for people who are in need. And uh, uh, if those people are left uh, on the sidelines, it is a disaster for our country. And uh, I think, unfortunately, we are seeing too often, uh, too many think uh, that uh, those who are poor, those who uh, are in need, somehow uh, deserve to be where they are. That if uh, they really worked a little harder, uh, they wouldn't be on the street or whatever. But uh, over and over again, over my lifetime, I have seen just the opposite. These are extraordinary women and men who, uh, by the grim happenstance of fate, need some help, need a helping hand, and go government can be a very powerful way in which that can happen. So that is, in that sense, uh, the political is personal, personal is political. And, and the idea of reflecting back on your experience, how was that the process for you? Well, I had the great good fortune. I wrote speeches for a governor when I was an undergraduate uh, and uh, a candidate for governor who became governor. Um, so when I was dean of the law school, uh, as I was, um, I started to look out and say, what, where are... are lawyers going and our lawyer, what, what is the needs of the legal system of five or ten years from now? 
And that was when I first realized that uh, 34 million people, now 44, uh, don't have any access to legal services. And I said, uh, I've got to quit this job and go see if I can do something to help in that arena. And I was fortunate to be able uh, to do that. And similarly, when, um, when I had the good fortune to be asked to, to run our foreign aid program for President Carter, I wanted to do that because I had the same sense that just as legal services are desperately needed for poor people, it's not just uh, to get a lawyer to do a little something here or there, it's between life and, and, and death uh, for so many poor people. Similarly, visiting third world countries abroad on behalf of our foreign aid program, I saw what a difference uh, small amounts of aid could make in helping uh, people uh, in that uh, uh, cliche sense of uh, learn how to fish, uh, to have clean water, to do all the things so that they could live fulfilled lives themselves. Thanks. Ernestine, the same question for you. What does it mean at this point or to reflect on the, your experience of, of life and to write, the, in effect, a memoir at this point or uh, about memories? Well, I obviously haven't had as nearly as many experiences as Tom has had, so it was a little bit easier for me reflecting on um, <laughs> probably the past 22 years of my life and engaging in public service for probably the last 10 years, so definitely a lot easier. Um, but I think... Um, it was easy to reflect on it just because I think public service has become a part of my identity as Tom spoke about. It has become a part of both of our identities and um, I think some of my best experiences in middle school and high school were when I was actually reaching out, um, visiting hospitals, senior centers. It wasn't when I was in the classroom and just memorizing history facts or um, writing another essay, which um, I learned a great deal during those classes, but I think it was just um, if I look back over the past few years, I think those specific public service, civic work experiences have left um, kind of a deep memory that I really remember. So. That's great. If I could add one thing. Ernestine brought an enormous amount uh, of fully equal partnership two ways. One of the things that uh, was so important our last chapter is about the uses of technology to promote civic work. Mm -hmm. It won't surprise you who was the lead author in that. <laughs> it wasn't Tom Ehrlich. I do email to word processing, but Ernestine opened up to me the, the array of ways in which uh, social media and other emerging technologies really could harness and marshal advocacy, uh, youth advocacy, on behalf of, of uh, issues, uh, we have a blog on Forbes.com, we have Huffington Post, all those things that uh, uh, she tutored me in. Uh, and uh, when I was a slow learner, she said, that's all right, we'll do it. Uh, and we went ahead and it's, um, uh, it's clear to me that um, the range of emerging technologies are going to have increasingly profound effects on the ways in which civic work is done mm -hmm. and how it's done effectively. And elections and government change and yeah. Ernestine, talk a little bit more about that and, and yeah. why you think or what you've done in those arenas. Um, so Tom is now on Facebook and Google Plus, so you can all follow him on that. <laughs> um, so I think- Do you tweet? He doesn't no. have a Twitter yet, but <laughs> That's okay. I have a Twitter, so and so does PAX. Um, so I think um, there's a lot still that needs to be done with leveraging technology and social media for civic work. I think um, we've seen in the last two presidential elections, um, President Obama might not have won if he didn't use and leverage mm -hmm. social media in both those campaigns. And um, we've started to see a large number of youth um, very active in social media when engaging in civic work. Um, so just to give an example, there's um, this project called the 100 Cheeks Challenge, and a student named Vinit Siegel, who mm -hmm. um, ended up leading that, actually a Stanford student and a good friend of ours. 
And what he did was he was encouraging students and young people and um, old people and everyone to swab their cheeks and actually register um, in the bone marrow registry and prevent um, and help cure people with leukemia. And he was able to reach out to people not only in his local community, but also people all across the nation, all across the world, simply by using social media. I think that's one of the powers of using social media is you can reach people not just in your local community, but thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. Another power is also the ability to actually visually see what that impact is. So I think um, beyond black and white text, you could actually use color, um, show images. And so when he was doing that, um, he actually used his Facebook page, took photos when people were swabbing their cheeks and just seeing that visual effect of someone doing um, something as simple as swabbing your cheek and registering for um, the bone marrow registry, um, that whole visual effect of social media. And I think in general also just being able to start something off the ground, you could easily start your cause on a Facebook page, on a Twitter page, and um, you no longer have to um, go through an elaborate, complicated process to just get your volunteering started off. So. Yeah, no, and Vinit's a great example, um, uh, particularly looking at bone marrow in South Asian communities and the kind of outreach he did and the results that he got. I guess I'd be remiss sort of if not asking something about where we are now. Uh, as, uh, in, in what is this, day four of, uh, of this mess that is Congress right now? Um, <laughs> Using that potentially, what sort of, if you were to write a, an additional lesson for young people today, what could you make of this? What would you say or how does civic work or public service or government service or any of the above fit in? This, what's happening right now is a loud call for civic work by young people, uh, middle-aged people my age. It is a wake-up call that we can't let democracy just run on its own rails. We've got to get in there and be actively involved. And uh, if we haven't uh, uh, <coughs> contacted our Congress people and the President and expressed our views and pushed and given support, uh, then we're not doing what democracy calls us to do. And if it hasn't it worked uh, today, we've got to push harder tomorrow. And the same for the day after tomorrow. It's, uh, it's absolutely, I think, uh, the single most important lesson that should come out. Unfortunately, too often, uh, particularly young people, may see this and just take a, this as a snapshot of uh, what goes on. Having worked uh, in government and with literally thousands of absolutely dedicated women and men who have give their lives foreign aid or legal services uh, because they really believe and it's going on uh, all over and if that gets stopped by some uh, derailment, then it's up to us to get in there and roll up our sleeves and make it right again. Ernestine? The last time a government shutdown occurred was about 17, 20 years ago, before a lot of people my age were able to walk or talk. So I think this is definitely, as Tom mentioned, a huge wake-up call. and. I think um, young people today and um, people of all ages need to not just take a step back and think of it as another instance of government not operating, um, not moving along the way it should, but um, as Tom mentioned, something as simple as writing a letter to Congress, um, congressmen, and um, being actually actively engaged in trying to solve the problem. Thanks. One more question for you then, I'm going to open it up to the audience. With the book out now, what life do you want it to have? What, what, what do you imagine, what would you like to see in terms of, other than everyone here reading it and, and getting a copy as they leave? I'd love to see more people involved in civic work and making it a part of their identities and um, just starting out with something very simple, um, volunteering at a local soup kitchen, volunteering at a local student group, um, and just jumpstart their civic work and um, hopefully for people who haven't been involved in civic work, making their 
um, maybe civic work resume as long as their professional resume. Thanks. Well said. The book is a vehicle, and we hope it's a vehicle that helps encourage uh, others. Um, and that's why we did it, and we had a wonderful time doing it, and we're going to keep right on uh, proselytizing as much as we can, <laughs> as widely as we can. Uh, and fortunately, um, people really feel good when they do civic work. Not to say there aren't disappointments and failures, and God knows I've had a lot of them, but uh, this is the high road, is the right road, and so... We're going to keep on doing it. Uh, I hope I have a lot of years to, to be able to do that. I hope so, too. Thank you. <laughs>